I'm David DeVessery, and I'm planning on talking about eidetic systems. Uh, but the first thing you may ask yourself is, what is an eidetic system? In fact, what, what does eidetic actually mean? Um, and eidetic refers to having perfect memory or total recall. If you were to have an eidetic vision, it would be a vision so vivid and so real and so crisp that you could remember every detail about it. Everything that happened, everything that came to be, it would be as if you were reliving the vision. And in an eidetic system, we're, we're going to do something similar. An eidetic system is a system that remembers all computation done on it. Every memory state, every temporary variable, all inner process communication in the system, everything. An eidetic system not only remembers everything, but it can also make meaningful queries about this information. In particular, the lineage of any of this information. Um, lineage referring to how data came to be or what data affected. Um, so, what might you want to do with, with an eidetic system? Well, imagine the Heartbleed vulnerability that came out around the time we were writing this paper. Um, administrators of web servers were in, in a little bit of trouble when this happened. They had no idea if Heartbleed was exploited on their server. Um, well, an eidetic system could answer this for them. They could, they could say, was Heartbleed exploited? An eidetic system could look at all instances of their server and find a Heartbleed message if it happened. Um, and then the server could ask, well, what data was leaked? Um, what left my system from this? Who, who, what user's data? What user's data might have been in my system? And an eidetic system could go back in time, and it could analyze the dynamic content generation system and trace this data backwards until it actually found the exact leaked data and what users leaked that data. Consider another example, um, which I'm going to call the wrong reference example. You're looking at a paper, and a colleague emails you and says, hey, your, your reference is wrong. It makes no sense. Um, what, what did you mean to do? And you can ask yourself, well, how did I get the wrong citation? What did I really want to do? An eidetic system can look back in time, and it can find the exact web browser instance that you pulled the citation from. And furthermore, it can pull up the web page and show you this is what you got. And you can recognize that, oh, I meant to pull the next page in my browser session, not this reference. And then you can ask, well, what did this affect? What further mistakes did I make by copying this incorrectly? An eidetic system can trace forward, and it can find all data that left your system, any email, any further paper citation, which said, or which shows the, the wrong citation. And then you can correct your error um, by using the eidetic system. So today I'm going to talk to you about Arnold. Arnold is the first practical eidetic system. It efficiently records and replays all user space computation. This includes process, register, and memory state, inner process communication, including file system communication. Um, Arnold can also handle these powerful lineage queries I've talked about that made the motivating examples so useful. Arnold's targeted towards desktop workloads, and on desktop workloads, it has very reasonable overheads. We found that we could, force, we could store four years of data in a user study we did on a commodity 150 terabyte hard drive. Um, we also found under 8% performance overhead on nearly all of our benchmarks, and I'll, of course, explain all these numbers later. So I've told you about what an eidetic system actually is, and I've told you about why you want one. Now I'm going to break my talk into two parts. I'm going to tell you about how Arnold remembers all state on your system, and I'm going to summarize that. And then I'm going to tell you about how Arnold supports the powerful lineage queries that I, I've give, shown you earlier. Finally, I'm going to conclude. So, what does Arnold have to remember? Well, Arnold has to remember years of state, and we want to remember it all on a single disk. But not only do we want to remember the state, we want to be able to query any of the state in a reasonable time. So that's going to dictate how Arnold remembers the state. Arnold needs to remember memory and register states, file system states, and inner process communication. So to do this, we're going to use a well-known technique called deterministic record and replay. We're going to record at a granularity known as a process group, and I'll explain to you what that means in a minute. We're going to track inner process communication with an abstraction we call the process graph. And then that alone won't be enough to store years of data. So we're going to apply many compression techniques to our record logs, which will actually let us store all of this data reasonably. So the first question you might have when building a record and replay system is, what granularity does it make sense for me to record at? So if we look at our system here, in this system, the squiggly lines represent processes, and the arrows represent some form of communication. Some communication happens between processes, and some communication comes from the external world. Um, the question we have is, what granularity do we want to record our system? Well, we could do a whole system recording. This is something like a virtual machine level record and replay, where we only need to record the inputs to the machine. 
Um, but then this will have very low space overhead because we're only recording really the external inputs and timings. Um, but it's very costly to replay this data because if we want to get a single byte out of any process, we would have to replay the entire system, which means we're going to have to replay a lot of extra information. On the other end of the spectrum, we could do process level recording and replay, where we record the data input to the individual processes, meaning now our replay is efficient. To get a byte out of a process, we only have to replay that process. But we're going to use a lot of extra disk space in recording the inner process communication. And we lose all of the inner process tracking that I spoke about as needing. So Arnold is going to use something called process group record and replay. Process groups are going to combine frequently communicating processes, something like processes that share memory. Um, and this will provide more efficiency recording because those very frequent communications won't have to be recorded. They'll be encapsulated in the process group. But, and it will also have very good disk space, uh, something similar to that of, of process level recording. But we're still missing this inner process communication. To capture this, Arnold is going to use what's called the process graph. The process graph has a, a pretty simple idea. Traditionally, when you record data in a process level record and replay, you just record that data came into your process. In Arnold, instead of recording the data that came into our process, we're going to record where the data came from. Um, and this will allow us to link the exact system call or set of system calls that wrote the data to the, the input. And this lets us trace data forward or backwards through our process graph. So now we've recorded our system efficiently, we can recall data efficiently, and we have inner process tracking via the process graph. But this alone isn't enough to give us years of data on a single disk. We also apply many space optimizations. These are optimizations such as model-based compression, our deduplicated file cache, X server compression, and semi-deterministic time. We then take this compressed log and we zip it. Um, and when we do all of this, we see a 411 to 1 compression, compression ratio over baseline. This compares to a 6 to 1 compression ratio if we were to just use gzip alone. Using this, we ran a user study where we studied four users on workstation workloads for two to four weeks. The users used three gigabytes of data a day or less, meaning that they store about a terabyte of data a year. Today, a four terabyte hard drive can be purchased for around $150. So with a $150 hard drive, you could store four years of data, all computation you've done on a workstation. Now, I'm going to tell you about two of our compression techniques due to time. They will be model-based compression and our semi-deterministic time. So the idea with model-based compression is that when we're recording data on our system, we're recording the non-determinism to our process. But the, because the data is non-deterministic, that doesn't mean that it's not predictable. In model-based compression, uh, we're going to predict what the data will be. And we're only going to record a deviation from our prediction. For example, system calls all have a return value. That return value is typically non-deterministic. You could have an error at any point in time. So we're going to predict that the system call usually succeeds. In something like a read, we would predict that we're going to usually read all the data we want to read. And we're only going to record the return value if it's something other than the value passed into count. This allows us to reduce all of these return values from system calls. And we apply many other forms of model-based compression, um, not just system call return values to our logs. In fact, this led us to, to think one step further and to think of partial determinism. Can we take an execution while it's recording, and can we try to mold that and make it fit into a more deterministic mold? And that's where we came up with semi-deterministic time. For semi-deterministic time, we're going to notice that some processes frequently ask, well, what time is it? They frequently query the time of day. And the time of day is non-deterministic. So continuously returning the time causes our logs to bloat. But we can do better than this. Time is a slightly fuzzy number. It can be off by just a little bit, a few milliseconds. And so in Arnold, what we're going to do is on the recording execution, we're not going to return the real time. We're going to return what we call the partially deterministic time. This is a time that deterministically increments based on the number of system calls or the number of instructions. And then when this time deviates too far from the real time, we're going to record, oh, our time's deviated. This means that if you frequently query the time, we're not going to frequently record the time. We're only going to record it whenever the time deviates too far, allowing us to greatly compress time queries. So now I'm going to finish my discussion of remembering data in Arnold with a talk of Arnold's performance. 
Um, and this in particular is our recording performance. This graph shows our runtime overhead versus a baseline system. Now, there are a few things I need to note in this graph. First, in this graph, we're using a second hard drive. We envision Arnold to be used with a logging hard drive, which is going to store your data um, that you could potentially switch out after you have years of logs stored. Um, we do have numbers in the paper for if you're not using a second hard drive. The second thing is that for racy programs, Arnold, or Arnold assumes that multi-threaded programs are not racy. We've taken all of these applications and we've removed the races from them such that they can record and replay easily. Um, and as you can see, our overhead numbers are very low. Arnold records less than 8% in almost all of our test cases, with the one exception being um, CVS Checkout. CVS Checkout functions somewhat like a Netcat operation. It brings all the data in off network, and in this case, it's off of a LAN, so it's faster than our hard drive can, can store, and it writes it to the hard drive. But since it's pulling the data off of the network, we have to store the data again. So we're going to have to store the data twice, causing us to have a slightly higher overhead. So I've told you about how Arnold remembers all state, and I'm going to tell you about the powerful queries that Arnold uses, the lineage queries, and how Arnold supports them. So Arnold supports two forms of lineage queries by default. It supports reverse queries in terms of me asking, me taking a state that exists and saying, well, where did this state come from? How, how did this data come to be? And then forward queries. Forward queries ask, uh, what did this data affect? If I had some state in the past, such as in the, the LaTeX example, when I found the wrong web page, I can trace it forward and say, where did this data propagate to? So in order to answer a query, Arnold's going to need two pieces of information. It's going to need to know the starting state for the query, and it's going to need to know the direction of the query. And then Arnold is going to trace within the process through intra-process tracking and between processes with inter-process tracking. I'm now going to break down how Arnold handles both intra and inter-process tracking. For intra-process tracking, Arnold is going to use taint tracking. We're going to dynamically instrument the replays on replay using PIN. Now, this means that we can run this heavyweight analysis, taint tracking, offline. On our recording, you saw we have low overhead. Later, when you go to do the analysis, we can take a little bit more time to get our computation done. Now, Arnold supports several notions of causality. Here I show you the four types, copy flow, or direct copying of the data only. Uh, it's not used in any mathematic operations. Data flow. Now, data flow considers things with arithmetic operations, like an, if you used the data as an argument to an addition, the result would be tainted. We have data plus index flow, which is data flow including accesses to arrays, and control flow, which is the standard control flow definition, where if um, you're tainted if you're used in a control flow statement. Now, as you'll see on the left, uh, the copy flow and the data flow are, are much stronger relations. They, um, if the input is just a copy of the output, then they're very highly related. Um, so we have very high precision there. But our recall is much lower. We may not find a lot of relations in a copy flow linkage. And as you can see on the right side, we have a much weaker linkage, um, something like control flow. You might not care about every control flow that happened on some piece of data, but control flow will miss very few relations. So the question is, if we have some query, a user says, I want to know what caused this output in LaTeX, what control flow should we use? Or what data flow should we use? I'm sorry, what causality should we use? There we go. Um, which linkage tool does Arnold want to use? And we're going to make an observation. We're going to notice that if I were to go through these and look at copy flow, copy flow wouldn't find anything related to LaTeX um, in the output. But data flow, data flow would say, you know, I think, I think this relates to BibTeX and to, to Vim. And then if we were to run a data plus index flow, it might link all three. Um, control flow would, of course, link all three. So here, Arnold's going to select data flow. And that's because data flow is the strongest relation that we can get in which we get at least one relation. So if a user asks what caused this to happen, here we're going to give the user the strongest results while giving the user results. So Arnold's default behavior is to select the most precise tool with at least one result. And we actually find that this works very well in our queries. I'm also, Arnold also must handle querying between processes in this inter-process linkage. There are two notions of inter-process linkage within Arnold. First is the process graph. I've already told you how we store the process graph and how it manages communication between processes. Arnold uses this to track communication between process groups. But Arnold can do better. 
if there's communication not through process groups, for example, if I'm reading my web browser and I'm typing into Vim at the same time, and I'm typing in the data that I'm reading from the web browser, well, we might want to link that too. And Arnold for this uses human linkage, which infers linkage based on input and output data and time. Now, human linkage is, of course, imprecise. It may have false negatives or false positives, but human linkage can capture relations that the process graph might miss. So how does Arnold work? Well, I'm going to look at two pieces of our motivating examples. We have more analysis in the paper, um, but this is what I have time for. So how does Arnold handle our wrong reference example? Well, in our wrong reference example, we start by opening our errored PDF, and the user will then highlight a section in our DVI viewer showing which text the user cares about. The wrong reference example then traces this backwards through the DVI viewer. You'll notice it uses data plus index linkage on the DVI viewer. Then through the process graph to LaTeX. On LaTeX, it only needs to use a data flow linkage because this is what gives it the relation. And then traces backwards through BibTeX, Vim, and Firefox. And you'll see at the top of the page, we use different linkages dynamically as we trace backwards. And when we trace from Vim to Firefox, we even use a human linkage to find the actual Firefox instance. Now, Arnold has a few false positives here. It finds some font files, some LaTeX style files, and some shared library files. These are all very easily trimmed. Uh, they're clearly system files. And Arnold finds no false negatives. It precisely identifies, well, it, yes, it finds no false negatives. It identifies the data that we want and no less. So um, how does the time look for this query? Well, on the surface, our query time appears to be about double our record time. And you might be asking yourself, well, you're running dynamic binary instrumentation. You're running taint tracking. That sounds outlandish. And it does. Um, but what you'll notice is these applications are actually highly interactive. So they don't do a ton of computation time. If you look at our numbers below, we break down the replay time and then the time to analyze with pin. And you'll see that we're actually several orders of magnitude above replay time alone. Um, but we still feel that this query time is perfectly reasonable. Here we have our Heartbleed evaluation. In our Heartbleed evaluation, we force Arnold to use the data plus index query. We don't want to miss any potential data. Um, and we find no false negatives or false positives. In Heartbleed, we are able to precisely identify the leaked data queries using Arnold. And once again, our numbers are below. They look very similar to the last query, um, having, almost, having similar query times and record times. But once again, when you break it down to replay time, you can see the overhead of taint tracking. So in conclusion, I've shown you how eidetic systems are powerful tools. I've told you about how, our, how eidetic systems can give you complete vision into past state and can answer powerful lineage queries about your data. I've told you about Arnold, the first practical eidetic system. Arnold has a very low runtime overhead. It can store four years of computation on a commodity hard drive, and it supports the powerful lineage queries that we want from an eidetic system. So our code has been released on GitHub, and I would now be delighted to answer any of your questions. Hi, Fred Douglas. Mm, second candy, sorry. Fred Douglas, EMC. Um, so this is really cool stuff. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm, Wondering, since I sometimes will operate on files that themselves, I'm generating terabyte sized files, um, but they're being stored in the system. Can you do something where you do copy on write or, or something where you can make sure you don't act like your CVS example? You yeah. said that you're making two copies of it, and so that was the thing that really slowed you down? Yeah. Could you make the one copy of it, and then when something changes, sort of squirrel away the original copy so that you would still have access to it? Yes, yeah, so we actually have several optimizations in the paper that we talk about. Um, we have a copy on read file cache. So if the data is generated within your system, we're only going to cache it on reading. And that's actually a cache. Because we're recording all computation on your system, the only thing we fundamentally need to save is the non-deterministic input to your system. Uh, we can recreate any intermediate states. So if you have some process or set of processes which are creating your terabyte file, we actually wouldn't need to save the file. We would only need to save the input to the processes. Um, and we wouldn't fundamentally need to keep the file around any longer than it's on your file system. In fact, we don't need to keep it on the file system, but we would have very poor performance if we didn't. But my question there is yes. what happens if the original input is deleted? 
if the original input is deleted. Yeah, are you tracking so, that so that... Well, we will track, we will keep around the original input when it comes into our system, right? Arnold has some outside of system input, which we store. Anything after the outside of input, we don't have to keep. So if your system had a file on it, which Arnold did not track it coming to be, that would be considered external input, and we would have to keep portion, we'd have to keep the portions of that file read around. Um, we could deduplicate those, and we do have a deduplicated file cache for this. Thank you. Um, Ethan Miller, UC Santa Cruz. So I, I also really like the work, and, and I was actually concerned, like Fred, about file size. Uh, another question is randomness. So there are a good number of programs that have randomness in them. Obviously, you can track input from files, network, and so on. But if you have a long, process, long chain of processes that generates a lot of intermediate results and does some randomness in there, how do you cope with that? I mean, if you have a lot of intermediate stuff, I guess you have to save all of it. Is there any way to optimize that? So as I said, data between processes we can, um, so in Arnold, for our desktop workstation use, uh, once again, we're targeted at desktop workstation Right, exactly. That's, that's, we didn't that's find, more of a concern for other stuff. Right, right. We didn't find anything that was, that was really driving where it generated a ton of data. Mm -hmm. um, but if we did, we have the ability to remove intermediate states because we know how they came to be. Um, so we only really fundamentally need to store the non-deterministic input. So if you're reading a lot of random data, just tons of random data, we're going to have to store it all. Well, that I'm is the about, cost of our system. I'm not talking system. about reading. I'm talking about internally generating is the problem. Like right. there's a CPU instruction on the right, Intel right. processors. I'm wondering if there's a way to hook that in. Right, right. So, so I would consider that an input of non-determinism. That If you generate a lot of it through the CPU instruction, we would have to record the generated non-determinism. Okay. Yes. Maybe two quick questions. Um, Jeff Kenning, Harvey Bunn College. I'm told that people who actually have eidetic memories, it's uh, really quite a curse. Um, <laughs> and I'm thinking that there are probably things on my machine that I don't want preserved mm -hmm. for various reasons. Um, <laughs> um, so have you guys thought about you know, giving the user a way to, to select what gets recorded and yes. what doesn't? Yes, and Arnold is actually we can use the power of our ability to query lineage to actually help us remove data. Um, so we have a slight discussion in our paper. And if you want to remove some form of state from Arnold, um, Arnold could actually find everything that relates to that state forward and backwards and could potentially remove any trace of that actual data because it can trace the lineage of it. So in fact, it, Arnold can help itself remove your information, um, which we think is an interesting observation. Yes. Thank you, Jim. What about temporary files? Do you keep them? Are they useful? Or is it a uh, problem when trying to understand the source of uh, uh, an information? Once again, temporary files follow something along the lines of um, intermediate states, right? A temporary file is something a process will write out and then read in later. Um, so we will cache it in our, in our read after write file cache. Um, but we can, of course, remove the file at any time with the ability to regenerate it. Um, and we do trace all lineage through it. Yes. Let's thank David again.